find a couple of things I want to say before we get started just to sell some things. One, I was told two times tonight that I favored Donald Trump. <laughs> But for some people, that's worth shooting somebody. <laughs> I just want you to know I'm not him, okay? <laughs> I'm his nephew, not really. <laughs> the second thing is, and I don't know if any of you would know this or not, because most of you are much younger than I am. I'm 38, and some of you are much younger than that. I started coming here to preach. As a matter of fact, it was one of the first places they ever got to preach, and I was the first chapter of Faith Home. I started coming here 50 years ago. Wow, amen. Wow. Now, yeah. that, yeah. when I think about that, I'm thinking, where did time go? Amen. Faith Home is probably the best place for anyone who is looking for help in their life. Amen. Amen. It doesn't have to be a drug addiction or alcohol addiction. Any need that you have, I want you to know you're going to hear the word of God here because they go teach it and they go preach it and they go live it out. And back several years ago, and statistics have probably changed, but Faith Home had over 30% success rate. And that might sound like a failing grade to some, but I'm going to tell you something. 30% is not bad. It's better than any program the government has ever put out. So tonight I'm going to be very straightforward with you. I usually am in my preaching. Some of you probably before I leave will want to throw an apple at me or something maybe a little bit more solid. But I want you to know that my, my prayers are for you. That's right. I hope that you'll pray for me. Amen. Over the book of Numbers, chapter 21, this is what it says, beginning in verse 1. And when King Arad, the Canaanite, which dwelt in the south, heard tell that Israel came by the way of the spies, then he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. And Israel vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, if thou wilt indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. And the Lord hearkened unto the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them and their cities. And he called the name of the place Hormah. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged, because of the way. Let me just say something, a little sidebar. It said the people who are being set free by the power of God in a miraculous way wanted to get discouraged because of the way, because of the land, because of the difficulties as they were traveling. And I want you to know tonight you're going to travel in some ways that's very difficult that's right. when you leave faith home. Amen. It is easy to come here with brothers and sisters with the same needs that you have who've been set free and to shout, and that is wonderful. We need more of it in our church. Right. To raise our hands and clap and amen and all those things, that is great. But when you leave here, as you make your decision which way you're going to travel, by the way, Satan is going to do everything he can to discourage you so he can cause defeat to come upon your life. And it goes on. And the people spake against God. Listen to that. Because it got difficult, the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore, based upon those things, have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water. Our soul loathes, disliked bread, didn't hate, didn't like what God was giving them. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. And they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. 
pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole. And, and it shall come to pass, listen to this, that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. I want you to understand right up front tonight, I hate snakes. I don't care if it is a rubber snake. I don't care if you draw one on a piece of paper and give it to me. I hate snakes. I mean, they, I see no value in snakes. Amen. People say, you ought to have a snake in your garden. Well, there's two problems. One, I don't have a garden. And two, the only good snake to me is a dead snake. <laughs> but do you know what? You can kill a snake but it doesn't know it's dead. The tail will keep wagging for a long time. Do you know that Satan is a serpent who is killed, who is dead, who is defeated, but he doesn't know it yet, and his tail is still whipping around trying to get every person he can to take them to the coils and pits of hell and to make their life on earth as miserable as he possibly can. You see, discouragement and defeat does not come from heaven. Right. It does not come, to throne, come from the throne room of God. But in this passage, what you have is a beautiful picture of salvation. Amen. Yes. Now, there is a difference in a picture and reality. That's right. The people of the Old Testament saw the picture. Right. But the people in the New Testament saw the person. Yes. Amen. And there's a total difference in it. Everybody has a picture of Jesus hanging up somewhere. We don't have a clue what he looked like. That's right. Come on. Amen. We don't have a clue what he looked like. But I want you to see tonight a few things about this passage. First of all, the serpents in the passage. In verse 5, you see these serpents were deserved. These people in the wilderness that God is feeding, God is giving water, God is leading out of captivity, all of a sudden they're angry at God, they're mad at God, they're talking about God, they're putting God down. I want you to know tonight, folks, the serpents were deserved by the people. Yeah. You and I deserve yep. the serpent. Yep. You and I many times Amen. have not been what we should have been for the cause of Christ. As a matter of fact, there is some, and it just tearing my nerves up, they will call God's name in vain. They're upset at Him. You know why people get upset at God? Because of their disappointments, because of the choices they made. They've got to blame somebody. It's got to be somebody else's fault. Even in the very beginning in the garden, when God came to them and they had sinned, Adam blamed his wife. That's right. He didn't accept responsibility of it and wound up they blamed God for what the choice they had made. So these serpents were deserved by them, and it's a symbol of sin. Satan had disguised himself as a serpent. But these serpents also were dreadful. If you look down in verse 6, he called them fiery serpents because of the intense pain. It is believed it was most likely Mid-Eastern vipers. Here are the symptoms of being bitten by a Mid-Eastern viper. One, the injection of the venom initiates a fiery pain at the site of the bite. Then swelling begins to take place right away. Discoloration at the side of the bite varies from white to flaming reds, purple, and dark blues. Victims experience nausea, vomiting, excruciating stomach pains, and cramping. Sound like somebody on a drunk does it. <laughs> uh, I mean, they wake up the next no, day and don't know why they had some good time the night before. Then the victims begin to experience extreme thirst. 
The liver and kidneys are damaged from filtering the toxins, resulting in extreme tenderness in the lower abdominal area, and many times diarrhea sets in. Hemorrhaging occurs in the form of nosebleeds or bleeding from the mouth or the eyes. The person usually bleeds to death internally. You see, when that serpent bites us, when sin bites us, there's an internal struggle that takes place. There's a spiritual death that takes place when we're bitten by that serpent. Suffering is prolonged usually for two or three days before a person dies. All of a sudden, what is beginning to happen? You see that the serpents were deadly. You begin to see here that many people, it says, died just like sin. Sin thrills and then it kills. Because the soul that sins, the Bible says, shall surely die. The fiery, fatal, fearful punishment for those who die in their sin is a place called hell. Now, folks, I know nobody wants people to preach on it. Now, you don't need to talk about that, preacher. We need to be encouraged when we leave the service. We sing uplifting songs, and, and we don't want you to discourage us by talking about hell. Well, let me ask you a question. Had you rather be a little bit discouraged and get to heaven, or you had you rather just be comfortable and die and go to hell? I mean, that's the only two choices in heaven and hell. Some people say, well, preacher, we go to purgatory. Now, if you're a Catholic, I don't mean to offend, but you need to read the Bible. Amen. There is no such place as purgatory. Amen. You won't find Amen. it anywhere in the Word of God. But you know what? The Catholic priest and church makes a lot of money off purgatory. You just go and pay so much money. And you can be delivered from purgatory. Are you right. willing to risk eternity on the right. line? Amen. Are you willing to die and go to hell because you would not listen to what the Word of God had to say? Amen. Sin brings forth suffering. Yeah. Amen. Suffering brings forth pain. And many times it takes that pain to bring us to the foot of the cross and Calvary. So you see the surface, and then you see the desperate situation. Down in verse 6, people are dropping dead like flies. There are approximately 2 to 4 million people in a 12 square mile area, mile area, and all of them have been bitten by a poisonous serpent. Think about it, 2 to 4 million. There is no hospital, if they had hospitals back then, that would, would be big enough for two to four million people. If they had an antibody, they wouldn't have enough because there would not be enough medicines for two to four million people. It is a desperate situation. It is a situation where no medicine can help, no pills can help. And I want you to know, even though the situation may seem desperate, with God is not hopeless. And I want you to know tonight when the devil comes to you and tells you there is no hope, people don't know what I have done, people don't know the depth of my life, people don't know the depth of my sin, people don't understand where I have been, I'm going to tell you tonight that is a lie from the pits of hell. You are not without hope. There is one who gave his life on the cross right. of Calvary that all those sins might be washed away. Right. Satan will take your past to defeat you in your yep. presence. Yes. Right. Do you know that God never brings up your past? Never. Amen. He said, I'll remove your sin as far as the east is from the west. I'll bear it in the depth of the ocean. But this is what it says. I will remember it no more. Yes. Yes. Now, when we get old on earth, we have a hard time remembering things that we want to remember. For instance, you can be in one room and begin to think, I need to go do this. And you can walk into another room and you get there and say, why did I come in here? <laughs> you know, we, we just forget it. 
But when God forgives, he forgets, he wipes the slate clean. You are a brand new creature in Christ Jesus. You are just as worthy as anybody else, not because of you, but he is worthy that will stand you. And don't you let the world tell you that you are useless and you have no hope because we are not hopeless as God's children. Amen. Amen. So you see the desperate situation, but you see the dynamic solution. When you have been bitten by a snake, you can do one or two things. You can sit and die if you choose to. Just like during the invitation night, you that are lost, you can sit there and go out just the way you came in, as lost as a duck is in a desert and walking over the portal of hell like a spider wheel, and you might go there at any moment. But you can choose to do that. Nobody's going to make you do anything, or you can get up and do something about it. Hey, right. Do you know that nobody can do it for you? That's right. Do you understand tonight that there are three steps that every person has to take if they've been bitten by the snake. One is, there must be conviction of sin. Right. Verse 7, the first part says, we have sinned. Right. The very ones who were talking about God and talking about Moses, putting them down, angry and mad at them, right. come and say, hey, we've sinned. And you tonight, if you don't know Jesus is Savior, you need to understand you have sinned. But you're not in it by yourself. Look around. Everybody in here is sinned. The word of God said, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Right. That word all means all. <laughs> it doesn't mean 99%. It means 100% of the people in here or you'll meet on the street, they have sinned in their lifetime. And if they want to get rid of sin, they have got to have conviction that it's wrong. Right. Amen. You're not going to stop being an addict if you're not convinced what you're doing That's wrong. Right. If you came Amen. here because you need the bed to sleep in and food to eat and clothes to put on, I'm here to tell you, you can get all that and still die and go to hell. That's right. Amen. That's right. That will not cover your sin. There's got to be that conviction, but there's also got to be confession. Look at verse 7. He says, we have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. True conviction always followed by confession. Amen. Confession is something that's hard to do. We don't want people to know our secret lives. <laughs> May I say this to you tonight? He already knows. You can't hide it from him, but it must be contrition. It goes on in verse 7. They said, pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The final step is to realize that God's your only hope. Amen. Not one hope, a hope, but the hope. That's right. There's nowhere else you can turn. Your mama can't save you. Your daddy can't save you. Brother Randy can't save you. I can't save you. Your pastor can't save you. Donald Trump can't save you. All I'm saying tonight is the only hope that you have is in the blood of Jesus Christ. And then lastly, there's divine salvation. You see, the cure for the problem is not a pill. It's not a potion. It's a brass serpent raised up on a pole. Now, there are three things you need to see in this brass serpent. First, it's a picture of guilt. Remember, the serpent symbolizes sin. Brass in the Bible symbolizes judgment. Yes. Being lifted up on a pole symbolizes a curse. For the Bible says, cursed is everyone who hangs upon a tree. Now, do you notice something strange? The curse took the form of that which caused the problem to begin with. It was a fiery serpent that bit him, but it was a brazen serpent that healed him. For he had made sin who knew no sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Amen. You see, when he went to the cross, he took your sin and my sin. He never sinned. Amen. Still hadn't sinned, won't sin throughout eternity. But man, we were born with a sin nature. We were good at it from our birth. 
I mean, think about it. A little baby wakes up at 2 o'clock in the morning crying for mama. I want to tell you something. It's not because it loves you. It's because it wants some milk or it wants to be changed. It's selfish. You put two or three children in the same nursery and there's two, two, two bad ones, I mean good ones and one bad one. When they come out after the church service, they're all bad. <laughs> I mean, it's easy to lead people down the wrong path. Right. It's easy to lead people down the wrong road. But there is that picture of guilt, but then there's the provision of God in verse 8. Salvation is totally God's idea. Have you thought about that? God's plan has never changed. From the time of Genesis through the book of Revelation through the time we're living in, it is the same plan of salvation. The people in the Old Testament were said to look at the serpent that's been provided by God and live. In the New Testament, we're, we're said to look to the Savior that is provided by God. The only difference in Numbers 21 is we see a picture of the Lord but in the New Testament, we see the real McCoy. It's so easy to be saved. And that's what God is trying to get across here, even back in the book of Numbers. There's a tremendous need with people dying in sickness all over the count and people crying out because of pain. And God says, I'm going to make it easy for you. Amen. You're not going to have to go to a pastor. You're not going to have to join a church, though you should when you get saved. You're not going to have to be baptized to get to heaven. Amen. But you are going to have to look to the serpent. Amen. You are going to have to look to the Savior. You see, that is the power of grace. First of all, it was infallible. It said to everyone who looked, they lived. Every one of them. It didn't matter how wealthy they were. It didn't matter how religious they were. It didn't matter where they came from in the walk of life. It was the Levites as well as everybody else. They had to do the same thing to live. Now, if I told you tonight, if you don't look at the serpent, if you don't look at that brass brazen serpent tonight, Amen. You go die and go to hell. That's right. Amen, brother. You'd probably say, Well, preacher, <clears throat> I, I'm just not sure I believe that. You don't have to believe it for it to be real. That's, <laughs> right. That's true, brother. When you're a little boy or a little girl, your mama told you not to touch something hot, you didn't believe them. You just did it anyway. But you got burned. So there is infallible. And secondly, it's also individual. It's to everyone to look for themselves. But you know what's amazing to me? Out there in the wilderness, not everyone looked. That's right. Because it said many died. Not everyone of them looked. Not everybody that comes through faith home will look. Some, will, some of them will come through and be a con artist. Amen. Now, back when I first started coming here, Brother Danny Barnes, a man I love who had the gift of discernment, he could tell a con from the real thing. He could tell if you really came because you wanted help or mama told you to come, or the court told you to come, or somebody else. Well, they had something back then. I don't know if they still do it now or not. If they came through and did not follow the guidelines, they were buck level. Y'all know what buck level was? <laughs> they take you from that little building over there where we started up to the end of the road, and he put you out with whatever you had that you brought, and he'd leave you there. He buck level and not think twice about it. If some of you go trying to come through here, you're going to be buck level. You're going to hear the truth, but you're not going to trust the truth. You're too prideful and you're too arrogant and you think you're too good to get on your face before God and cry out and repent of sin. And all God says is, look and live. Look and live. It's individual. But it's also instantaneous. Yes. 
They didn't have to wait. They didn't have to pray. They didn't have to pay for salvation because salvation is not a process. They looked and lived. And then the distinct stipulation. Look to Jesus. You know, it's easy for people to die in their sin. Yeah. And you can ask the question, what do I have to do to go to hell? You know the answer? No. <laughs> you're headed right. that way if you don't know Jesus. Right. I mean, you, you're just as close. You don't even know how close you are. I believe every time a person has the opportunity to be saved and they reject that opportunity, they're just a little bit closer to hell. Because God's Spirit is not going to always strive with man. He doesn't have to convict you again. He's already done that. He's definitely not coming back to die on the cross again. He's already done that. So we need to understand here the people died not because they were bitten, but because it didn't look. Because they were all bitten. I can hear them now. A man looks to, to the serpent, as God said to do. He is hurting, he's in pain, he's in agony, and he looks, and all of a sudden, man, he is completely healed. He probably let out a shout every neighbor in that area could hear. He is healed. So he decides, I want to try to help other people. And he begins to, to go to one man and he looks in the tent and he says, all you got to do is look. And the man says, I'm too sick to look. Not even the serpent could heal me. So he goes to another tent and he said, well, I don't feel like this snake bite is all that bad. I, I just don't think it's that bad. Matter of fact, I haven't been bitten as bad as some people. I've only been bitten once. I know some of the deacons in the church have been bitten two or three times. Yeah. Well, I might go look because that deacon's been bitten more than I have. He's in worse shape than I am. And if he's going to heaven, I'm going to heaven. Yeah. That's kind of how they rationalize. He goes to the third tent. And they say, listen, I'm not going to look until I get that healing feeling. <laughs> People tell you all the time, a preacher, I just don't feel it yet. And I say, well, what do you got to feel? Well, I don't know, but when I feel it, I know I felt it. <laughs> I don't mean to say I'm approved, but that's stupid. Amen. Salvation is not a feeling. Amen. Your healing, it's not just a feeling. And then he goes to the fourth tent, and the man says, I don't believe in that brass serpent theory. I'm not interested. That's the way some of you are tonight. I've heard it all the time, preacher. I just don't believe it. The fifth tent, he says, sir, you are sick. If you'll just look, you'll heal. And the man says, you know, I've really kind of gotten attached to this snake. Or at least he's gotten attached to me. And I'm not sure I want to get rid of him yet because I'm enjoying what I'm doing. That's right. There's some that come here that enjoys the sin of what I can right. afford too much to leave the sin right. at Amen. the foot of the cross. Amen. Yeah. And when they leave, that 70% or whatever percent it would be now, you know the problem they have? They go right back to the same friends, yep. the same places, do the same thing and expect them to be a different Amen. outcome. Amen. That is that's a definition of insanity, by the way. Amen. When you leave here, if you go back to those same places, you might be able to withstand it a few weeks or a few months or a few weeks, days. But old Satan's gonna bring you back to your old life. You gotta cut loose sometimes. You know, I'm biblical coin. You gotta turn it loose, get away from it. <laughs> You say, well, preacher, I don't have any friends. You don't have a friend that wants you to stay an addict. Nope. They're not your Come friends. On. That's right. Come on. Come on. Amen. As a matter of fact, they're a tool of the devil, and you they don't even realize it. Amen. What they need is to get what you got when you got here, That's rather right. than you get what they got when you see <laughs> Amen. And 
then of course you need to lift up Jesus. Amen. John 3, 14, 15 says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Yeah. I want you to have your sanctified imagination for just a moment, okay? I, I want you to be in that desert where it's hot and it's dusty. And I want you to be there when you're looking around and everybody around you is dropping dead. Now that serpent's right over here. And you got a little child that's in the tent lying on a cot. That as sick as they can be. I can see you right now as you go in there once you have looked at the serpent. And you go in there and you pick up that little child. And you carry that little child out to the tent door. And you say to the child, look, look, look. Yeah. And you take the little child's head because it's too weak to, to lift itself up. And you help it to look toward that serpent. And all of a sudden, the strength that was lost come back into that child. Amen. And they're made completely whole. Amen. And if you've got a family, That's right. the Bible says you go reap what you sow. Yeah. I hate that. I mean, I wish I could say you're not, but we are. Yeah. Huh. And some of you are going to go home to children that you're going to find going down the same road that you've been. They go wear the same sandals you've worn. They're going to make some of the same mistakes that you made. And every time that you see them make that mistake, it is going to break your heart. You're going to pray for them every night and every day and every morning and you're going to cry out to God and the more you cry out to God, it seems like God is not listening. It seems like there's no hope. I'm going to tell you, lift up Jesus in their lives. It's more than telling them who Jesus is. It's more being Jesus to them so they can see what Jesus looks like. That's right. Amen. And I can promise you this. If you will lift up him, that's right. and you bring that child to the foot of the cross, and you leave it there with Jesus, yes. he wants him to be saved more than you do. Yes, yeah. that's right. And you might not even see it in your lifetime, but God's going to answer your prayers. <laughs> but you can't go back to what you've been and expect them to be different. That's right. Because they're going to say, I've heard it before. That's right. I'm tired of hearing it. I don't want to hear it anymore. I don't care about that serpent you're talking about. It hasn't made a difference in your life. Why should I expect it to make a difference in my life? That's right. Amen. And if you're not careful, you're going to give in to the flesh. And then in a short period of time, be right back where you were before you came. Amen. 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 True. That's not what God wants for your life. That's right. Right. You gotta trust Him. And you gotta believe Him for your children. Amen. Yes. Right. Yeah, we make mistakes. We're not perfect. We need to confess it to our children. Amen. Let them know you're not perfect. Let them know that you have made mistakes. Let them know that you you traveled a road you wish you hadn't traveled, but you can't go back and untravel it. Amen. you got to start where you are, but together we're going to start here, and we're going to lift up Jesus, That's right. and we're going to look to Jesus, and we're going to follow Jesus, and we're going to let Jesus have his will and his way in my life. Amen. And before it's over, Amen. You go see your child. One of these days in heaven and glory. When that little child is a grown person now walks down that street of gold. And you're sitting by that crystal river as they come walking by. You go shout. When you see them move into their mansion that you are already living in your mansion. You're going to say what I gave up for the flesh was worth it. Yeah. For eternity. Thank you, Lord. This life is short. If you live to be a hundred, 
That is a drop in the bucket compared to eternity. That's right. So it's your choice. You want to feed that old nature, that old flesh, leave it like you came? Or do you want to confess that you sinned and look to the cross and say, Father, I can't save myself, but you told me you'd save me. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, the promise is they shall be saved. So it's your choice tonight. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to come to you. Matter of fact, I'm not even going to fuss and, and plead with you to come. Because the Holy Spirit of God is not dealing with you. You're not going to come. And if you do, you don't mean it. But if you sense that small, still voice that's speaking to your heart, and that spirit is saying, it's you, it's you, it's you, look to the serpent, look to the cross, look to Jesus, do it tonight. I'm going to ask you to come. And I'm going to ask you to humble yourself. And I'm going to ask Brother Randy to have a time of invitation to pray with you. And let God graciously save you. Shake that serpent loose from you tonight. Don't be so attached to the serpent. You'd rather live for the serpent than live for the Savior. Amen. Father, thank you tonight for who you are. Thank you for that amazing grace. Lord, 